to admit that I never felt comfortable with the postmodernist pension <clears throat> for spatial metaphors. It always seems a little obsessive and just a bit banal to me. It always reminded me of the famous quote about excessive formalism in a field being a symptom of a lack of anything significant to say. Trajectories of arguments, deconstruction of concepts, dare I mention cyberspace, all seem to confirm Sun Ra's portentous yet comic summation of an era in which space is the place. Could it be that we are merely living through an age of universal wholesale reification? <clears throat> Works in the media ecology tradition, especially those of Walter Ahn, account for the phenomenon, though they characterize its emergence as an early modern event with pervasive effects throughout the modern era. A heightened visualism induced by hot visual media brought with it a tendency to conceive of everything as some form of object arranged in space, or even as a type of space itself. The new visual orientation towards space had many benefits as seen in the growth of modern science, as well as drawbacks as seen in intellectual trends like Raymism, where the intangibles of human judgment are represented by the schematic arrangement of concepts on tidy printed charts. <clears throat> but although Ramus and his followers showed little awareness of the metaphoric nature of the use of space on their charts, and even less awareness that they were objectifying subjective aspects of mind, Mannerist painting of the same era is the first style in the history of art to use space in an explicitly expressionistic way. The crisis of the Renaissance destroyed faith in objective representation, and artists begin to consciously deform space as a means of expressing their alienation. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, if following Kant, we think of time and space as forms of perception, then space, which Heidegger says has no being of its own, is a meaningful dimension of human activity. Yeah, see there. Space means what the eye and the body do in it. It represents the interaction between organism and environment. The formalism that began with mannerism and went on to define modernism in painting is a practice that expresses abstractness, what Adorno called that irritating indeterminateness of what it is and to what purpose it is. It introduces, it produces aesthetic distancing that comes from appearance no longer being meaningful and space itself being questioned. The with the catastrophe of meaning, appearance becomes abstract. Mannerist art is about that incommensurability of space. Much has been said about the many different causes of this intellectual crisis of the 16th century, but one of them is quite simple in its inherent spatial na nature. Voyages of exploration and the increase in the scale of social organization brought with them a sort of crisis of space conception on a relatively concrete level. Represented space vastly exceeded any connection with the continuities of human action and experience. To regain some sort of spatial coherence, maps needed to assume an imaginary bird's eye perspective that was alien to, the, to life as it was lived on the ground. Thus distanced, they assumed an aesthetic quality of abstract paintings in space. Even the much smaller but spatially complex new urban centers made for an unprecedented amount of indirect experience that did not correspond to any direct, directly lived reality. Spengler and the decline of the West correlated the limitless space of modernity with the Faustian soul. To use a dramaturgic analogy, the scenery had become too wide for the drama to the point where people began to suspect that the whole scenery was but a fabric woven of their imaginations. With this loss of faith in the reality of the world, the third dimension or depth disappears, for it is in this depth that the temporal value of the world is found and interplay goes on. I believe that the general semantics of space <coughs> must be rooted in this interplay of organism and environment. For language, such rooting is suggested in Lakoff and Johnson's simple but brilliant work, Metaphors We Live By. Language develops through metaphors. New concepts come from old concepts used metaphorically. Those old concepts come from even older concepts used as metaphors as well. So then, where do the fundamental concepts come from? If they themselves are metaphors, what are they metaphors of? Lakoff and Johnson call them orientational metaphors. And they say that these metaphors are the primal, these are metaphors of the primal orientation of the body in space. They are expressed by and show the importance of prepositions which express relations that at their most concrete are spatial. It is <coughs> often said that movies are about perspective, 
because the cinematic language of which they consist, shots and editing, correspond to the perceptions of an observer who interacts with the situations depicted. Cinematic space can have an involving depth by making the connection between the cognitive and imagined locomotive activities of the viewer and the representations of characters and events seem natural. <clears throat> that this is maximized through realist technique is underlined by something that Werner Herzog once said about the use of 3D photography in his documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams. The eye is essentially lazy. When we are not intensely engaged in a situation, we see in two dimensions. The eye must be challenged by a meaningful interaction to take the trouble to see in 3D. In typical 3D movies, which are usually horror or other light sensationalism, the individual shots are of insufficient duration, let alone intrinsic value, for the eye to involve itself sufficiently. His documentary on the prehistoric paintings in the Chauvet Cave in France, on the other hand, was shot with one camera in long takes. The narrow, labyrinthine spaces of the cave and the irregular surfaces on which the images were painted are highly relevant to what Herzog is saying about them. The eye becomes more actively and more becomes involved more actively and more readily constructs a deeply meaningful space. This is in contract to the special affect of sci-fi, horror, and other genres more amenable to postmodern flat flattening of their imagery. A, simple, a recent example of this, executed with the self-consciousness of a true mannerist, is the movie Snowpiercer by the South Korean director Bang Joon-ho. The, object, the objective plot denoted by the imagery is an absurdity. After attempts to counteract global warming have led to an ice age, an eternally self-running train circles the globe with humanity's remnants aboard. Class struggle ensues. Questions about the legitimacy of hierarchical order are posed. But why a train? Why circle a dead planet without ever stopping? No one is really going anywhere in the literal sense. Except for lengthy dialogue shot in noirish, theatrically lit spaces, the movie is a set of systematically organized spatial metaphors. The train's movement represents the one dimensionality of human society. The linear nature of the train itself is a metaphor of social hierarchy, leaders up front, oppressed in the rear. Rebellion takes the form of moving to the front of the train. When metaphysical religious issues are addressed, circular motifs are introduced. In other words, space <coughs> expresses social dynamic. In its claustrophobic isolation within the train, it is alienated from the cold unreality that is the natural world. It is this subjective social science fiction rather than the science fiction of a physical world that the movie is about. Another example of space being rooted in the interaction of organism and environment can be found in Susan Sontag's remark that photographs are about time. Although this seems not to be true of various forms of abstract photography or photographs taken purely for their formal qualities, perhaps the prime example of what Sandhag is talking about can be found in the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson. Bresson used the same camera with the same lens all of his career. He never cropped an image, never altered it in the dark room. His genius was largely in being at the right place at the right time. What is, si what is singular in his photographs is not just that he captures singular events with remarkable comprehension. It is the sense of the viewer's immediate relation to the subject that gives his images their superlative power. With a photographer like Diane Arbus, it is more a sense of personal than physical relation that is so compelling. Recent research on <clears throat> animal intelligence shows that border collies can read clues about what is expected of them by attending to movements of their trainer's eyes. Eye movement, along with body posture, signals the purposeful interaction of meaningful intention and its object through space. Unlike the decentered denizens of postmodern space, the dog knows to root, root the meaning, indeed the reality, of space in living action. That it is able to do this vicariously through the actions of another is truly remarkable. I was wondering the other day if what such an intelligent animal would make of the eye movements of the multitudes who are flocking to the huge exhibition of Picasso sculpture uh, presently in display in MoMA. It's a great show, you should go to that. Uh, I have to confess that although I went along with the idea for many years, I never really could see the multi-perspectivism of his work. To me, it speaks of a sort of despair of perspective rather than its multiplication. 
to overemphasize, cube, to overemphasize cubisms and other modernist art forms, obvious similarities to tribal art, I think, is to miss the innocence of the latter and the jaded quality of the former. Picasso's shell game of realism and abstraction has always been largely about the crisis of spatial coherence. As one after another, each subject represented is deprived of its solidity and location, the eye is gradually denied the very concept of a reference and left to a purely connotative ocular dance. No wonder his painting has been referred to as steamrolled sculpture. This most recent Picasso show left me with the same impression expressed by Peter Sheldahl in the New Yorker Review, that Picasso was more naturally a sculptor than a painter, though all his training and early experience, and by far most of his prodigious energy, went into painting. Or rather, perhaps as a, magic as a major consequence of his involvement with space, is the erosion of the boundary between two-dimensional and three-dimensional media themselves, in addition to all of the distortions of their represented contents. Quite literally, Picasso sculptured with painting and drew and painted sculpture. Perspective drawings of abstract sculptures complete with cast shadows on an orienting ground contrast with sculptures made of painted and folded two-dimensional surfaces. His two versions of the work guitar are visionary in their pioneering of what has come to be called negative space. The sheets of material that would describe the instrument's surface instead open up to serve as mere borders that define an inner void which becomes the work's active feature. And this, is this acoustic space, familiar to the ear but untranslatable to the eye? Or is the artist foregrounding the emptiness that remains when all that is solid melts into air? In other works, painted two-dimensional surfaces on multiple planes offer suggestions of depth, only suddenly to withdraw the offer and leave us with a mocking amorphousness. More extreme are Picasso's wire sculptures, often referred to as his drawing in space, in which the medium takes on a one-dimensional quality. To focus on the lineal medium of these works seems to me to miss the point. Instead, it is the underdefined space which the medium cannot begin to contain that is the message. The abstract, perhaps even meaningless quality of these lines and surfaces is contrasted in other works with a wide variety of found objects from everyday life whose meaning is sucked into the vacuum. Coincident with the opening <coughs> of this historic retrospective of Picasso's sculpture is the announcement from Johannesburg, South Africa of the discovery of a new species thought to be a missing link between the genera Homo and Australopithecus, Homo naledi. What is conspicuous about this stage of evolution is the relatively small brain size for a member of the genus Homo and the impressive size of the hands, feet, and teeth. Like the prehensile thumb, the presence of these large appendages at the root of our evolutionary tree is seen to underline the importance of the ability to physically interact with the environment in the development of human intelligence. The hand teaches the mind to grasp. Looking at published photographs of these early remains, I cannot help but be reminded of the huge hands and feet of so many of Picasso's subjects. Are they also groping toward a more meaningful existence? Another artist who spent his life so groping was Picasso's hero, Cezanne. In a marvelously clear and enlightening essay, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, discusses what he refers to as Cezanne's doubt. I prefer to think of it as Cezanne's hope under the circumstances. As an artist and as an individual, Cezanne was extremely alienated. Yet as Merleau-Ponty explains, in many ways he used that alienation to find his way back to reality, to return to the object without abandoning the Impressionist aesthetics which takes nature as its model. The old masters, he said, replaced reality with imagination and by the abstraction which accompanies it. Instead, he was pursuing reality without giving up the sensuous surface. He wanted to depict matter as it takes on form, the birth of order through spontaneous organization. Yet in striving to capture this primordial world, he never wished to, quote, paint like a savage he wanted to put intelligence, ideas, sciences, perspective, and tradition back in touch with the world of nature that they were intended to comprehend. He wished, as he said, to confront the sciences with the nature from which they came. His method for this confrontation involved forgetting and then utilizing those sciences to recapture the structure of the landscape as an emerging organism. In doing this, he took us toward a reason which would embrace its own origins by making visible how the world touches us. <laughs>